Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Looks like we have a nice turnout today. This is our fourth meeting during the public comment period uh, for the general permit for discharges from domestic wastewater systems with flows greater than 100,000 gallons per day. I'm Jennifer Epp. I'm the Waste Discharge Requirements Program Manager here at the Central Coast Water Board, and we definitely appreciate everyone taking the time with us today. Next slide. So just a reminder of the project schedule that we've been working on, and you've seen this slide before. Uh, we started working on this project last year and had some initial public meetings um, with many of you back in January as well as February. And then now here in June, uh, we've been having weekly check-ins with you to go over questions that we've received from the permit and have an opportunity to receive your questions. And then our plan is to have public comments due on Monday the 20th and then to take the draft order on September 25th to the Central Coast Water Board. Next slide. And today we're going to review some of the draft general permit details, the effluent limitations. They are some of the um, key components of the permit. So we're gonna do a little review. And then we'll go over a few questions that we got yesterday that we also think you might be interested in hearing the answer to, and then open it up to the group and see what additional questions you have um, about the permit. And then as always, um, we are available to talk with you individually about your specific permit. We then are doing that with some of our existing permittees and we'll continue to do uh, more of those discussions later this week. And so please reach out and we can really dive into your specific questions about your permit and may, how it may um, apply to your particular facility. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelsey Gearhart for the next slides. Actually, it's going to be me, Jennifer. So, my apologies. Uh, Thank you, Howard. That's, that's okay. Uh, my name is Howard Cole. I work in the WDR unit uh, for Jennifer, and I help draft the order with Kelsey. Uh, we have gone over this information before. We're going to talk a little bit about the technology based effluent limits, how we came up with that, uh, some different constituents, and then go through the groundwater and recycled water producer issues. Next slide, please, Tim. Now, this graphic that you're looking at is not in the order. We've developed it outside of the order to work with dischargers, and it will be part of an information package that we give to the dischargers to show how to work through the permit. But essentially, you would find your treatment technology type. You would go down to a particular table in the basin, uh, I mean, in the um, draft order and then you would also be able to find your way to the monitoring requirements associated with that treatment type. Next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of what the requirements look like for secondary treated effluent for activated sludge and other facilities that are similar to that, like a sequencing batch reactor. Uh, these numbers were, uh, are from EPA documents or um, the basin plan. Next slide, please, Tim. And then this is a, a, another table in the document. So tables three, four, and five, which are for particular types of treatment are required. And then one portion of the order allows you to evaluate what your effluent might look like, um, what the quality is, and if you have some of these other issues or other constituents in your um, influent, you would have to evaluate the need for treatment and you might need to use these limits. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Kelsey right now and she's gonna go through a little bit uh, of some other tables in the order and some of the monitoring. Kelsey? Thank you, Howard. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelsey Gerhardt. Um, I'm an engineer and I work in Region 3. And I work in both the site cleanup and WDR program. 
Um, so how are, as Howard had indicated, there are four different subsets of effluent limitations specified in the general permit. And these effluent limitations will be evaluated at the time of the application and enrollment process to determine how they apply specifically to your wastewater system. So Howard walked us through the two uh, subsets of ethyl limitations, the first being dependent upon treatment technology used, and then the second being dependent upon the quality of raw wastewater entering your wastewater system. So the third subset of effluent limitations that I will walk you through are conditional and are based upon the basin plan water quality objectives, the agriculture water quality goals, and the maximum contaminant levels for drinking water, also referred to as the MCLs. So as shown on this slide, the discharger has presented two options, option one being on the left. So if the discharger elects to comply with the effluent limitations specified in table seven of the general permit, and I'll go over table seven in the next slide. Um, so they need to comply with the effluent limitations specified in table seven, and this will demonstrate that they are protective of water quality. If they're unable to comply with these adopted effluent limitations, you may be required to implement a groundwater monitoring program. And this will bring us to option two, which is shown on the right side of this flow chart. So if the discharger elects not to treat wastewater to the effluent limitations specified in table seven, the discharger will be required to implement a groundwater monitoring program and demonstrate underlying water quality is not being impacted and or degraded. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a subset of table seven. So as mentioned on the previous slide, dischargers are required to demonstrate that the effluent leaving the wastewater system will not degrade underlying water quality. Again, this is done through either the adoption of effluent limitations specified in this table or through the implementation of a groundwater monitoring program. So I wanted to take the time to briefly walk you through how to use this table. So if your disposal or treatment area overlies a designated groundwater basin, which will likely apply to most of you, you are required to comply with basin plan table 3-6 as shown on the left side of this table. If not, you are required to use the MCLs, which are the maximum contaminant levels for drinking water, and the basin plan agriculture water quality goals. So a discharger may also request executive officer approval to use water quality objectives from an adjacent designated basin. The general permit does walk the dischargers through how to use this table, but as always, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to contact either Jennifer Howard or myself, and we're happy to explain it. Next slide, please. So the fourth subset of effluent limitations um, applies to non-potable recycled water producers. If treated non-potable recycled water uh, from the wastewater system is discharged to land for the purposes of reuse, the discharger must comply with the following. First, the effluent limitation specified in Table A of the general permit, which is also shown on the slide here. Uh, the requirements established in the Division of Drinking Water Conditionally Accepted Title 22 Engineering Report and with the Division of Drinking Water's Conditional Acceptance Letter prepared for the specific wastewater system. So now that we have covered the four subsets of effluent limitations specified in the general permit, and please feel free to ask any questions um, later on this presentation, we're happy to answer anything. I will now hand it back to Jennifer. Thanks, and I'm gonna go over um, a few questions that we received yesterday. We don't actually have slides for them, but we thought um, they might be questions that the larger group would um, like an answer to. So the, the first one was, is enrollment in this permit required? And so the answer to that is, if your facility is a facility that this permit is applicable to, so you're discharging over 100,000 gallons per day of domestic wastewater, then our intention is to enroll almost all of those facilities in this permit. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, Monterey One is a great example of that, where it's a very complicated system, a very complicated permit. The permit is fairly current, and so we would not be enrolling uh, that facility in this permit. And our strategy is going to be to work on enrolling the oldest permits and the facilities that are um, having the most um, significant impacts on water quality currently, you know, by uh, the current effluent at those facilities, we'd be looking at enrolling those first. And really the, um, because we have so many old outdated permits, we have two options. You know, we can essentially take those permits and put them into this general order, 
or we can do an individual permit for those facilities. And if we were to do an individual permit for those facilities, it, that individual permit would look very similar to this general permit. And so our goal is really to get as many people uh, as possible into that uh, general permit. The next question we got was um, when they were reading the monitoring and reporting program, it talked about submittals into the GeoTracker database as well as submittals via email and wanted some clarification if um, they were supposed to submit information into, to both via email as well as GeoTracker. And so currently the MRP, the monitoring and reporting program is written uh, to have people do submit both ways. And we are working to transition over to GeoTracker fully. We need to make some upgrades to our database in order to do that. And so at some point, uh, those, those monitorings and reporting programs will only have submittal to GeoTracker, uh, not both mechanisms. And those of you who have a more recent permit or more recent monitoring and pro reporting program, that's exactly what you're currently doing. We um, have many facilities that are currently both submitting into GeoTracker as well as uh, via email. The next question that we got that we thought might be useful to share was about the permit application documents. And the question was referring to section VIB16 of the permit where it says that the Central Coast Water Board may require that updated permit application documents be submitted. And the question was, you know, what does that look like? Which facilities would you be wanting updated permit uh, documents for? And so what we're working on is a notice of intent form, which will enable people to submit the information that we need and that people can, can follow the format. And really the reason why for some facilities we're gonna need more current information than you submitted when you applied for your permit originally is that a lot of, for a lot of facilities, because their permits are so old, that information is now updated. They have made changes to their facilities. Um, you know, they, the, the process flow diagrams that they submitted to us were no longer valid. And so we're gonna be um, giving really specific instructions on what we need from the different facilities. And for some people, it'll be the exact, you know, we'll already have that information that's current on file. And for some facilities, that information will be quite outdated and we'll need lots of um, updated information. So it'll really be dependent on the, on the facility and how um, the information that we already have in our files, how well that matches your, your current scenario. And with that, I'm going to go to the, the slide that we have here, and this goes over the meetings that we've been having over the last few weeks, including today. And if I go to the next slide. And those of you who are on the interested parties list, you should be have been receiving emails from us that have told you that we've been posting recordings of these meetings on the same page where we posted the draft general permit. And so you can either find them at this link or by doing a Google search for Central Coast Water Board tentative orders. Next slide. And as we've mentioned before, this is the contact information for Jennifer Howard and Kelsey. Feel free to reach out to any of us as several of you have done and we'll continue to have some really good discussions with various facilities with some detailed questions on their specific permits. Next slide. And you've seen this slide before. This is where you can find the draft documents. And as I mentioned, you can search for Central Coast Water Board tentative orders and find that. And then the interested parties list, if you have people in your organization that haven't signed up and wanna make sure that they get all our emails, you can also do a search for Central Coast Water Board interested parties lists. Next slide. And as we've talked about before, there's two types of comments that you can provide. You can provide us any sort of informal comments and questions during all of these meetings. And then if you do want um, your specific comments to be included with the package of information we submit to the board with a formal response, you're gonna wanna submit those comments by Monday. And this is the email address. And this information is contained also, if you um, do that Google search for the Central Coast Water Board tentative orders, you'll see the public notice document, which contains the instructions on how to submit those formal comments. Next slide. 
And with that, we'll, we'll open it up to the group and see if we're able to answer any of your questions that you might have. It looks like we have a nice amount of participants today. It looks like we have 18 of you on, which is great. And we haven't had lots of questions, so my guess is if people just want to unmute themselves and let me know that they have a question, that would be an okay way to, to manage this. You can also try raising your hand as well, but I know that's a little bit challenging for some folks depending on what program they're using. And we haven't had a lot of questions on these, but but that's okay. We've had lots of good questions offline, so. I have a question. This is Jack Great. from uh, California American Water. Ah, thanks, um, Jack, go ahead. Howard mentioned about the treatment technologies and uh, and then uh, the effluent limit, uh, I think, uh, uh, Kelsey uh, talked about the, have to meet those uh, effluent limit based on the uh, basin uh, water, qu water quality criteria. So with the existing facilities, and uh, if I have a set this uh, treatment uh, already, and uh, if the treatment uh, tech, if through the optimization we can meet those uh, discharge, uh, if we can meet those uh, uh, effluent limit, but that effluent limit not uh, meeting the, um, the other table uh, criteria, so what do we need to do? So I'm not quite sure that I'm following the question. Okay. So, so um, uh, for example, I have a pond system. You know, uh, if the pond system, then the effluent limit uh, has to be achieving based on that table, uh, I forgot the table two or three. Um, so if I met that, but that effluent qu qu uh, quality not necessarily good enough for the table, I guess, table seven or? So what do we need to do? Do we need to reinvest in the capital to upgrade the treatment system or? Yeah, so there's there's two things that the, that the permit is doing and the, the shift in this permit compared to some of our really older permits is there is more specificity. So for some of the facilities that you have um, at CalAM, those permits are, are quite old. And so what you likely have in those permits is a requirement that your discharge can't cause or contribute to an exceedance of the water quality objectives in the basin plan. But that's all it says. And so what we've done in this permit is we've helped you provide some specificity to knowing that you need to be protecting those water quality objectives that are in those basin plans. And what we've done by providing the effluent limits is given you a path where you can um, meet the effluent limits at the surface and therefore protect those beneficial uses at, at the groundwater level. And the reason that the permit provides two different options is, you know, some dischargers have expressed that they'd rather just not have to do the expensive monitoring to demonstrate that they're not impacting those water quality objectives that are in the basin plan, but it's easier for them to just meet a target effluent at the surface. And so that's why the permit um, allows you to do those two paths. You cannot do the groundwater monitoring and achieve the effluent limitations, or you can um, do the groundwater monitoring and demonstrate that you're meeting uh, three six of the, the basin plan water quality objectives. Howard and Kelsey, is there anything that you want to add to my explanation? No, I, I think that's great. Um, so my understanding of the questions were if you meet the treatment technology based effluent limitations, but you're unable to meet table seven, what do you do? The response would be that you're required to implement a groundwater monitoring program, as Jennifer had mentioned, and demonstrate that you're not impacting or degrading underlying water quality. Great. Thank you for that clarification. And um, so then the follow-up question on that is that what, you know, um, like uh, Jennifer said, uh, you, if you just continue to do the groundwater quality monitoring and uh, basically 
uh, you spend a lot of money, you install the wells, and then you do the monitoring, you really not really helpful to mitigate the impact if there's impact uh, to the general, uh, to the groundwater. And um, so in that case, where well, the regional board giving the uh, option allow extra time for the um, facilities that are investing money in the capital Im improvement in their treatment plants, so give the, the overalls to improve their treatment um, systems. Yeah, so I, I think, do I understand your, correct, your question correctly, Jack, that you're saying that, you know, so to say you are doing the groundwater monitoring and you're determining that, yes, my facility is um, negatively impacting those water quality objectives, would we provide the facility some amount of time to get there? Is that what you're asking? No, actually not. Uh, actually, um, you know, if it's not impacting the groundwater system at all, but you, you have to continue the monitoring over the years. So basically you spend money on the monitoring side. So would you rather to uh, um, have the facilities to spend money on the uh, upfront to even get the quality uh, better? to make sure they consistently meet the, uh, the basin water quality objectives. Uh, okay, so I think I just, so if you're, if you're doing the groundwater monitoring and you are, that groundwater mo monitoring shows that you're not impacting the groundwater quality, you are gonna continue to need to do that monitoring. Um, what we sometimes do over time with facilities is we do adjust the frequencies, you know, so, um, you know, depending on what the data is showing, sometimes it's appropriate to, okay, we have a lot of consistent data, we can potentially reduce some of the frequencies because it looks, you know, like that's not going to change much over time, but we will continue, we will require some amount of continued monitoring for the facilities that are doing the groundwater monitoring route. Does that answer your question? Uh, not exactly. Basically, uh, my, my, yeah, my question is the uh, basically the tech, you know, based on the technology based uh, effluent limit, if our system is capable to meet that limit, but that limit is beyond uh, the water quality objective uh, listed on, in Table Seven. So, uh, you know, from a from a um, for the benefit of the, uh, to protect the environment and the groundwater perspective, uh, in my opinion, we should spend the money to upgrade our treatment technologies instead of uh, just doing the monitoring. Yeah, and I think that's a fair opinion. Yeah, and, and, and that is really why we provided those two options, because we okay. often have dischargers that express that they would rather um, instead of doing the expensive monitoring, they would rather meet an effluent limitation that they. Um, that so the question is the. So the question is that will you uh, will you allow us maybe work together to build a, like uh, you know, multi-year um, plans to upgrade the system instead of spending money to install the uh, groundwater monitoring wells. Yeah, and your, your, your question is right on, Jack, because we have been this week discussing that exact concept is like, okay, what if a facility wants to go in that direction, doesn't want to go down the groundwater monitoring route, is there a way that we can build in the, the time? And so there's a couple of ways that we could potentially do that. Um, we could potentially add that into the permit itself where it, it allows that option or we can enroll people in a permit and do what's called a time schedule order where we give people X amount of time to get to, uh, to where the permit is. So there are a couple of options and I'm glad that you brought that up because we, we've been contemplating that exact question uh, this week. Great, thank you. Okay, and I see a hand raised by Christina. Can you hear me? I know my headphones weren't working. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to add, um, two points to what Jack was saying, or maybe uh, follow up or clarification. Hey, Christine, well, do you want to introduce yourself first so people know? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Christine. I work in the WDR program and I'm in charge of domestic facilities in Monterey County. So specifically Jack Wang's Callan facility is under my purview. And I wanted to add that just a clarification that the technology based affluent limits in the table have to be complied with, that there isn't an option to do 
um, groundwater monitoring in lieu of those. So I wasn't sure if Jack un um, understood that that piece of the permit that the the groundwater monitoring is related to table seven. Uh, yeah, I understand. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that piece. And then I, I was curious if there were certain, um, I guess it's, it, I see it as it's up to the discharger to decide uh, whether they would do the groundwater monitoring or upgrades to the treatment plant with discussion with water board staff. But it, there isn't really a, a direction that we would direct the facility to go in. The permit doesn't specify. So that's something we can talk with you individually about your, your facility. Great. Clarifications, Christina, and thanks for the really good questions, Jack. And I know we're going to talk more specifically about some details about your permit later today as well. Uh, any other, I don't see any other hand raised, but anyone else have any questions that they'd like to raise at this time? Jennifer, this is Howard. Um, I just want to encourage any uh, facilities, anyone who wants to talk to us offline about your individual facility to give us a call. We've already had a couple of those. We're having another one today. So if you have specific questions about your facility, please give us a call. Okay, and I'll just give another opportunity if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask any questions. I'd like to ask a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I, it was mentioned to me that this general permit could uh, affect the recycled water uh, permittees and stuff like that and and they would then um, because we issue those permits to them that now they would have to go through your staff to get a recycled water um, basically user permit from from the regional board is that in fact what's uh, planned or how is that part of it going to work yeah I'm I'll take a stab at that and then Howard and Kelsey, you can chime in if I've, I'm mentioning. So for the facilities that are doing recycled water, there's, there's two aspects of the permitting. There's what we um, refer to as the production side and the user side. And um, for any recycled water projects, both of those sides need to have coverage. And sometimes those are the same entity and sometimes those are different entities. And so the mechanism of recycled water through this permit will um, handle the production side. And then for the user side, um, we have a, a different general permit, I think it's 0068 if I'm correct, that um, users enroll in. And sometimes the same person who's doing the production takes on that user permit and the responsibilities of that user permit and then um, is in charge of the administration of that water. Sometimes the person producing doesn't want to take on that responsibility and says, well, I want my individual users um, to um, instead be enrolled in that user permit. So it can happen either way. Did that confuse things more, Garrett, or did that answer your question? You're on, you're muted. I think, it, I, think it, uh, I think it somewhat answered the question. So if the, you know the 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 permittee underneath that other general permit could then issue their own permits to other users as long as the overall um, stipulations of the general permit are being met. Is that correct? So, and you and are you talking about the user permit? So, if you as yeah. your entity wanted to hold the user permit um, and and be, in, be responsible for the reporting and the administration of that. And then you could have your own mechanism to how you're dealing with those individual users to make sure that they're meeting the requirements. Is that what you're exactly, asking? Yes, that, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and I'm, I think the answer to that is yes, right, Howard? Yes, the answer to that is you can do that. We have it, as Jennifer said, both ways, but even where we have multiple users for a single facility, those are, typically like a water district or a sanitation district that's then providing that reclaimed water to more users. So the, we have one situation where the, the 
producer did not want to track all that. So we issued these to these water districts and we have situations where the producers are willing to track it and they can send it out to multiple users. We just write one permit to the producer and one permit to the user. Does that help Garrett? Yes. You broke up a little bit, but I, I think that was a yes. Oops, yeah, he's back on mute. Okay. Well, feel free to unmute yourself if we didn't, uh, if we made things less clear. Uh, let's see, I think I see that Tony has unmuted himself. Did you wanna ask a, t a question, Tony? Yes, Jennifer. Uh, Great, thanks, Tony. And can you let me know, uh, your name is familiar, but could you remind me where you're from? Yeah, I'm working with the city of Greenfield. Oh, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, the question I have is just your expectation of the schedule of the going from our old permit to this enrollment in the new permit. I'm just trying to get a sense, a very broad sense of what does that look like from your point of view in terms of uh, major steps and then, you know, time period. Is that a, is that a three month, six month, 12 month process from your point of view? That's what I'm trying to get a handle on. Yeah, so Christina, you can weigh in on this, but I think the assumption is that uh, Greenfield, because of the permit, is as old as it is, is that it, it wouldn't be one of the last ones that we do. It would be, you know, at least a relatively high priority um, that we would include. But this is going to take some amount of, of time. So this is not going to be, you know, a three-month process. I don't know, Christina, do you have anything you want to weigh in on schedule for Tony? And I and I, I'm glad you asked that question, Tony, because I have in my notes that you left me a, a voicemail and I needed to call you back. So we can also talk some more, more detail offline if you want to as well. Sure. I think, Tony, we'd like to start working with Greenfield um, right away on the plan to get into compliance with the upcoming permit and get feedback from you on um, your scheduling for um, upgrades or you know changes to the plant that I think need to be made. So it, we might not enroll you right away, but we want to start working with you immediately uh, with a goal to, en to enroll as soon as possible uh, with, with potentially you know some a plan for um, plant upgrades. Okay yeah that, that it sounds like as we're you know as you know we're in the middle of a we have Corolla engineers doing a, an assessment of the plant technology right now. And we're a couple of weeks away from our technical reports and a regulatory review. So, you know, the, the next two or three weeks would be a good time to maybe sit down and say, here's what we see right now. And then, you know, we want to ask the basic question based on our current technology, are we going to be able to meet the new um, mm -hmm. requirements? And we want to talk in some detail about that and get your feedback and all that kind of stuff, because that's all going to be critical. So, so uh, do you think we should call you when we get to that? information instead of a meeting with that you know, this is still ongoing yeah i think the sooner the better and even thinking about you know what 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 are the costs for you to get into compliance with the existing permit and um any comments you have i guess on the existing permit uh you still need to get to us by the 20th so if you want to even have a call before then or with the consultant uh, we could do something quick too for that in addition to um, a few weeks from now. Okay. Christina, you said existing permit, but you mean the, the draft permit. Yeah, the draft and, permit, sorry. And, and yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm thinking if your consultants have questions or comments on the draft permit, we do need them by the 20th. And so I don't wanna wait for a few weeks if you've got a lot of comments you know, on the general permit, let's make sure we, we can address those as we move forward and you give us your plan. And it, the plan it then comes in um, compliance with the general permit as it, as it moves forward. Okay, I'll, I'll remind our, our team about that then. Okay, thank you, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to know. So I think we'll, I'll put that on my schedule and try to work it into our, our, our process we got going here. Yeah. And just for the context of the other folks on, on the call, Christine has been working with Greenfield for a while in order to you know, get the changes that the facility needs to get in compliance with their existing permit. And then a lot of those same things are gonna help them comply with this uh, proposed permit as well. So, thank you. Questions, thanks Tony. Yeah. Jennifer, can I add kind of an overall uh, water board staff has gone back and looked at the age 
of when all the or the dates of when all the permits were issued and right now um, and these are ballpark numbers based on the 44 permits we've evaluated approximately 12 or 2000 uh, the year 2000 or older so they were issued issued prior to 2000 another 15 or so are between 2000 and 2010 and then the last batch are between 2010 and 2020 so even if everything went perfect, it takes approximately two to three months to enroll somebody when we start the dialogue, prepare the draft NOA, talk to the discharger about what's in it, have a review of the draft monitoring program, and then issue the NOA. So we're looking at, on a perfect schedule, we'd be able to enroll somewhere between three and 12 per year but we're looking at years to enroll everybody into the order and then coupled with the issues christine has brought up and and that greenfield is dealing with sometimes it takes a little longer sometimes it goes a little faster so uh, those are kind of ballpark numbers yeah and as i mentioned earlier we're we'll be prioritizing the facilities that have the oldest permits or that have you know just some poor water quality coming out of their their systems and so, you know, a great example of uh, a newer permit is, is Mission Hills, and I imagine that that's going to be at, at the bottom of our list because it is a fairly new permit and there, um, that system is, is doing quite well. Great, and thanks for those clarifications, Howard. Uh, any other, just looking at the list here to see if I've got anyone that's either unmuted or has their hand raised. Give that a couple more minutes. Okay. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I know that we're all very busy and, and hopefully these various meetings that we've had over the last few weeks haven't been too much of a burden on everyone's schedule. I know we uh, bombarded people with uh, several different meetings, but we wanted to you know, especially in this remote environment that we're all obviously working on from our homes here, that uh, we were able to provide as much outreach and, and information as possible. And in some respects, it's nice because we can all just, you know, join a meeting for uh, 40 minutes and we didn't have to get in the car and drive and didn't have to worry about meeting set up. So um, this, this format does have some, some good benefits for all of us. So once again, feel free to, to reach out. We look forward to continuing to have discussions and um, we'll continue to have some follow-up with some of the entities that we talked to over the last couple of weeks and didn't have all the answers and we'll be getting back to you with um, some more detailed responses to some of the questions that you had. So with that, I wanna thank uh, Kelsey and Howard and Christina as well. And I hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thanks. <laughs>